but if yeah. great okay yes yeah, so we're recording okay so let's see if we can get a more acceptable gallery view going here so you can kind of see more people Okay, all right, so let's get started. Um, so yeah, so welcome everybody. Uh, so the, this title, the title of this session is How to Talk to a Biologist, uh, Tips for uh, Computational Scientists. Uh, and so yeah, we've got two leaders here. Uh, myself, I'm John Albeck. I'm uh, currently an associate professor at the University of California at Davis. And uh, I am the biologist uh, here who's you know, kind of um, hopefully provide some perspective on how to um, uh, you know, how to talk to people like me. Um, and then we have Carlos Lopez, the esteemed Dr. Lopez from Vanderbilt University, <laughs> uh, who is, uh, yes, as, as we were just saying, a, a modeler, uh, but one who's really interacted with a lot of biologists. And, you know, Carlos and I have had a, um, a long history of being able to interact with each other, and um, which has been great. I've really enjoyed that, um, that interaction over, over the years. And so I think, um, yeah, hopefully we can offer some perspective. And we're hoping that this is really a discussion uh, for everybody, right? This is, you know, not us telling you what to do so much as uh, all of us sharing uh, what's worked and what obstacles have been and, uh, and things like that. So I should say a little bit about, you know, why we're doing this, you know, it's mainly, you know, as David explained it to me, uh, it's in large part because uh, it was inspired by papers like the ones we have on the screen here. Uh, and there's a history of uh, some really nice uh, writing on this subject that kind of dates back even before I got into science in 1993. Um, and, uh, and, and the idea was that um, since the other concessions right now are geared towards being introductory material for uh, mainly for, um, for biologists learning computational biology, there should be something in the program for, for the computational scientists who aren't necessarily leading those or providing the, that instruction. So what, you know, what could we talk about? And it seemed like it would make a lot of sense to, um, to talk about communication going, going the other way, right? So if, if somebody's, um, you know, so if, you, if you're approaching a biologist or working with a biologist uh, as a computational scientist, what should, um, you know, what should you be aware of? What things are important to think about and so on? Um, so yeah, these are a few, um, a few references here that, um, uh, that David Stone uh, very nicely dug up. Uh, and you can see that, like, like I said, they kind of go back a ways and they, and they kind of continue up through, um, up through the present day. Uh, and so this you know, prompts the question of, you know, why is this such a perennial subject? Uh, why, you know, why are we still, uh, why haven't we integrated better yet? Um, what's, the, uh, what's taking so long in getting biologists you know, to kind of really embrace modeling? Um, but, you know, and I, I think you know, I, I, there's a number of answers to that, right? Uh, you know, and of course, one answer is that this already is happening, right? There already are plenty of collaborations and, you know, that, that are great uh, between biologists and, and modelers, uh, and those are fantastic. Um, but there are some things that do keep biologists from perhaps, um, uh, from perhaps, you know, taking advantage of what, what, off, what modeling has to offer and what, what questions could be answered. Um, and one is, you know, kind of captured by this first quote here that was from the, you know, that very early article. Uh, where the author relates that uh, he says a Nobel Prize winning molecular biologist said to me recently, there may be some good ideas there. He's talking about modeling, uh, but we don't really need any more good ideas right now, right? So, and, and I'd say that perspective really hasn't changed much uh, since that was, you know, said in 1993. You know, biology is really in this very you know, information rich phase right, where uh, just the experiments and the experimental data just keep coming fast and furious. And it's in some ways all, all a biologists can do just to keep up with you know with the technology and and the pace of of the discoveries purely in the biological sphere, without necessarily getting into you know how, what question what other questions could we be answering with uh, you know with a more computational approach or with a more model based approach. So I think that's one thing, right? Is that you know there's just biologists are busy, right? They've got a lot already. Uh, another thing is that uh, this other quote from from Hillis in 1993. Uh, was that because most mathematics is not very useful in biology, biologists have little reason to learn much beyond statistics and calculus. And the result is that the time investment required to understand what is going on in computational models is not worth the payoff. And so, um, and it, so that's really a training barrier, right? You know, it's, and, it, and I think that's very true, right? Even biologists who had, you know, I went through a, you know, a, a, bio, a qu fairly quantitative biochemical 
major as an undergraduate, you know, I took PCHEM and, uh, you know, thermo and quantum and, uh, and, uh, and calculus and all these things. Uh, but I did not come out really prepared, I think, you know, to really get over the barrier um, of, of understanding what, how a model works. You know, there's a lot more that had to be done. So there's a, a bit of activation energy there. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, this last quote from the Drubin and Oster paper kind of you know, really just chalks it up in part to cultures. You know, there's, you know, you have very different cultures in the biology world in terms of what's considered a, you know, a big paper, what's considered a, uh, an important finding, what's considered an important question, um, and how do people even just run their careers, right? You know, what, um, what's worth spending your time on in terms of getting your career to move forward and so on. So there's a number of reasons. Um, so that being said, so that's just kind of the intro to why we're doing this. Um, there's still, you know, these things are still present, they exist. And so how do we get over them? Uh, so today's agenda, um, I figured we could start with some introductions. I, you know, there's few enough people here that we can go around and, um, and we can talk about what, um, uh, you know, each of our backgrounds briefly and, and tell us where we're from and, you know, what, our experiences uh, have been in interacting across the aisle, so to speak. Uh, and then we have a number of discussion topics, which are kind of break, gonna break into two areas. The first is really kind of understanding the mindset of a biologist, uh, these first three topics here. Uh, we'll have a short break because that makes sense over the course of two hours. And then um, uh, we'll have a second uh, set of topics about how to engage uh, effectively with biologists. And so, you know, um, you know, what can you do to, to be useful and to, um, uh, you know, to, to interact effectively. So um, yeah, so each, and each of these we're gonna you know, pose as a little discussion. Uh, I'm thinking with the number of people here, um, fading actually, we're right on the cusp of what I considered for breakout rooms, right? Uh, and whether or not we would do breakout rooms. Um, you know, we'll cross that, yeah, that bridge in a minute when we, when we get there and see how many people are on board still at that point. Um, but let's do that. Um, let's let's start with introductions. Um, maybe um, yeah, Car Car I guess Carlos and I should probably start. Carlos, would you like to go first? Can you give a sure. quick introduction? So my name is Carlos Lopez, and um, I'm a social professor at Vanderbilt University, like uh, um, John already said. And it's one of those interesting things that that I'm here because um, I started life out as a physical chemist, as a condensed matter physicist, and I did a lot of computer work and. Um, and uh, the challenge for me was um, to really, so I, I kind of felt like at the time, the, the mentality was, you know, if biologists don't learn physics and math and computation, why should computational people learn biology, physics and math? And I was actually one of the first people that I know of that actually just jumped completely and went to a, found a mentor that was willing to take the risk and bring a person that knew very little biology um, into a biology back environment. So, um, so I think that uh, I can tell you what not to do <laughs> in terms of interacting with biology and computation. But certainly what I've learned is that speaking both languages, the languages of math and biology can go a very long way. So I'll, I'll leave it there and uh, I guess I'll pass it on to Daniel. And, and please choose someone that will go next. So that makes it easier. Hi, yeah, I'm Daniel. Yeah. I'm a postdoc at Georgia Tech. Uh, I work with uh, parameter estimation and uh, modeling of uh, phosphonazitides. And yes, I want very much to know how to speak with biologists because I found it <laughs> difficult sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, could could you, I mean, each as you're introducing yourself, perhaps could you say a little bit about how far down the road in terms of working with, you know, what experiences have you had working with biologists? Have you completed a project already or are you just at the outset? Of um, yes, I just I completed the project, and usually speaking with biologists, well, there are people that already have a good mindset, but especially the youngest people that was deep in the biology field, usually are the ones that I find more difficult to to talk to. Usually the older guys, I don't know, <laughs> usually are easier to 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 talk to. <laughs> Yeah, some perspective is usually a good thing, right? Um, great. Uh, yeah, Daniel, do you want to pick someone to go next? Uh, John Cooper. It's the one that. <laughs> yeah, hi. So I'm, uh, I'm at WashU in St. Louis, and uh, I study the set of skeleton and cell motility. As a graduate student, like 40 years ago, I wrote 
computer program to model the kinetics of atom polarization. I did that in Fortran and wrote it and ran it on a PDP 11. And I'm sure nobody even knows what that means. Uh, I, I and, I'm, I'm older than I look. Okay. And that's really cool. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Uh, but so, and then I've always wanted and needed help with mathematics and computational things. And so I've always sort of sought out people like that. And as I was saying before we got started, early in my time here, I got invited to give a seminar in the physics department by Anders Carlson, who we who we saw mentioned this morning. And I've always just welcomed that. And uh, but I do agree that people speak different languages, and it takes a lot of patience and understanding about what their respective goals are. And I, I'd almost say engineers, I mean, I've had a lot of interactions with engineers too, and they are really different because engineers like to just make something that they think is cool. And if it doesn't, they don't care if it answers a question. Uh, so, but I've come to accept that too. So, uh, so and, and then I've, in my interactions with Anders, we've gone on to do a lot of sort of cell biology things, not unlike the sort of uh, actin patch stuff in yeast that you've, we, we heard about. And Anders was the first person who asked me, how many molecules are there in that? You know, I'm like, gee, I never thought of that. So he, he always wants to know that. And then Anders also always wants to say, well, figuring out the mean, that's, that's okay, but the variance, that's, that's really interesting. So mm -hmm. I've, mm -hmm. I've learned a couple things along the way. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, no, you're, you're foreshadowing a number of things we're gonna touch on here, so this is great. Um, excellent, yeah, you wanna pick someone to go next? Uh, how about Charles Hodgins? Okay, yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Charlie. I am a uh, new postdoc at NC State. Uh, working with uh, Belinda Aqua, and um, I'm kind of I might be one of the uh, the odd people out here. Um, I'm more of a like hybrid kind of person than a pure computational looking at biology. Um, but one of the reasons why I wanted to attend this session is um, I think it's always useful to see yourself in someone else's mirror. I guess to you to to mangle a metaphor. Um, I wanted to you know I'm I'm currently you know struggling with how do I explain the the computational side of stuff that I'm doing now with the biological collaborators that I have, but I know that also I have my own biological biases that you know can get in the way, and so you know wanted to see what uh, kind of the what's going on over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Um, yeah. yeah, to pick somebody else. Um, how about uh, Renee? Uh, Renee Dell, are you available or? Yeah, hi. Okay. Uh, awesome, yeah. then I pick you. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Renee Dale. I'm a postdoc at um, uh, Danforth Plant Science Center. Um, and um, um, I guess I kind of, for, for, I guess, background about me, I started out as a biologist, if you will, in my master's, and then kind of went computational for a PhD. So, um, and my uh, current postdoc advisor is a biologist so I, I feel like I'm getting better at the um, communication aspect, but still struggle with like, um, especially explaining research interests. It's hard for me not to like go too far in the weeds or just start naming like systems that I think they might be aware of. Um, yeah, so. Um, Great, yeah. And uh, about um, Iman? Hi, I'm uh, Iman. I'm a postdoc at Yale, working on Professor Burrow. Uh, I, I do uh, modeling about clustering method uh, and the synthesis. We are, I'm like uh, similar to John. It's very really interesting that people are still doing it. I'm doing modeling the active filament, mm -hmm. and but I'm using like new languages like Java. <laughs> It's not for anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
and um, uh, in our lab, the majority of my colleagues uh, do biology. So it's really helpful because now I have to interact with them like on the daily basis and like learn their language, understand what is important, what is not important for them and um, what might work and what might not work and like how long things uh, would take for them to like do. Like if it, it, for example, if I tell them like, okay, can you cut this protein in half? It's not like that they, it, it, they can, they do it like overnight. It might take them like one or two years to just cut the protein or, yeah, or if I tell them, oh, can you take this picture? It might take them three years to do this. So it, it's really good to see things like close. Okay, I think I'm going to uh, yield to Jason Hughes, if I speak if correctly. Yes, uh, Jason Hughes. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student in the lab of Gregor Neward at Vanderbilt University. And so my background's in chemical engineering, so more quantitative sciences, uh, studying gene expression, noise, and memory in yeast asthmatic response. And I'm doing a mixture of computational and experiments. So mm -hmm. generating my own data and then building or, or calibrating models using it. Yeah, excellent, yeah. And so uh, I think I did, did Michael Blivinov. I'm not sure if he's OK. Mm. I have to leave in five minutes, so I'm really kind of uh, uh, so just, just sucking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I think maybe. Um, Yes, yeah, so if you have to get going quickly, maybe we'll have um, Hossein go. You go, Hossein? I was muted, sorry. Okay, hey, okay. hi, everybody. Uh, this was great prospect from everybody. I would consider myself also, at the moment, hybrid in both computational and experiment. I'm a poster currently at Vanderbilt University with Gregor Neuer studying cell signaling, basically developing an integrated framework to measure signaling dynamics and build uh, mechanistic predictive, uh, predictive signaling models. But I come uh, from a physics training, but I have done this hub to pure experiment or pure theoretical labs where I did my undergrad in physics, then I experienced this uh, having a master with uh, pure experiments with optics experiments where I was doing like setting up lasers, doing optical setups, recording this optical devices, which was pure experiments. Then from there, I came to a PhD lab where I started, I had no uh, computer or uh, programming uh, experience, I was interested to essentially get expo uh, experience in this uh, modeling field. I did my PhD in kind of biophysics, building models of chemotaxis for bacteria. And for my postdoc, I joined the lab that has both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's great. Great introduction to everybody. Um, thanks for sharing your uh, experiences. Um, yeah, so um, I guess, yeah, I think I sort of went before, but I guess I'd say, you know, overall, um, you know, my background as, is mostly as a biologist, but I kind of always have thought of myself as a biologist with a um, sort of a mutation uh, <laughs> that makes me, you know, makes me really interested in um, you know, to me, the, building a model was a really intuitive uh, thing, right? You know, I, I guess in some ways, I never, I very often didn't believe the the cartoon version of um, of biology like we often learn it, and I, I I wanted to know if that really held up. If you if you could do it, if if you could 
you know, simulate it, right? If you could simulate how something worked, then you could really understand it, right? Um, and so I, I think I, you know, or, you know, sort of gravitated towards people like Carlos. And, you know, I did my training with um, a guy named Peter Sorger, who's, you know, um, and has done quite a lot of, you know, he sort of, he was switching at around the time that I uh, joined his lab from just purely, you know, biology to doing more systems biology. So it was, it's been nice to, um, you know, interact with a lot of people along the way um, and, you know, that are really interested in uh, building models. But I'll say one thing that I've often struggled with is really, even though we've done many of these, um, you know, most of the projects I've been involved with in my career have really in, in, involved definitely some experimental measurements and also models. Um, is really to communicate to biologists, even of my own, you know, you know, in my own department, what it is I'm trying to find out. You know, what, why why is it so interesting to have a model uh, as opposed to just having a, you know, um, a nice cartoon you can draw at the end of the day, right? So, um, so yeah, that's and that's, that's still something I think I'm slowly getting better at. But um, especially writing grants can be quite challenging when you can't convince the other person, you know, that you know we should really be doing it this way as opposed to just the way that it's always been just, done yeah just to put out one thing uh, john uh, mm -hmm. for introducing themselves uh, yeah. i took some notes and i think everyone touched on three main topics mm, yeah. uh, cultures between biology and uh and uh, i guess quantitative sciences mm -hmm. the different questions and how you ask them and uh, how to communicate so mm -hmm. you know i think that this is this is really good because we could keep coming back to those as we go on so you know. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, exactly. That's that's great. Um, yeah. So yeah, Carlos, I think that's great. Um, yeah, those are I think really are kind of our three themes here, right? So yeah. So why don't we jump into our topics, um, right? So the first one, actually, before we go um, here, we, I suppose we we should decide now. Would we rather, you know, so for each of these topics, right? So I'll, I'll have a slide or two to kind of introduce it, and then kind of a discussion prompt. And we have a choice. We can either just do our discussion as a group, since we're not a very large group. Um, or we could do breakout rooms of say like four people and have if you know make a smaller um, discussion room. Do you maybe by show of hands is everybody um, can everybody see their um, raise hand button? Oh, you know we could do a poll. Wait, hold on. How do you do That's what I was Oh yeah, we could do a poll. Actually, yeah, we could do it the real official way, right? Oh, I don't think we have the the, the power to do a poll. Yeah, it's too hard to do those on the fly, right? But. Um, Maybe, uh, yeah, if you, if you can do raise hand, I guess. Um, who would prefer to do large group? And let's do that first, uh, as opposed to small breakout groups. I think large so group. Like, looks like everybody's got their hands up. Would anybody prefer to do a, it looks like we're <laughs> pretty unanimous here. Yeah. Um, okay, well, yeah, I think that we works. Have, yeah. We couldn't see you guys because you're not on video, but that's okay. Yeah, there's always the virtual hand you can raise, but. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Awesome, we'll do a large group then. Yeah, let's do a large group. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I think that'll be fun. It'll be a lot of, I think there's a lot of great perspectives and it'd be nice to really see what everybody thinks, right? So, um, okay, so the first um, the first topic is really um, yeah, just kind of getting at this idea of the mindset of a, of a biologist and how it's different. Uh, and you know, I think this, this Hillis article, you know, if you ever have a chance to read it, it's very short. Uh, very pithy though. It's got a lot of really, um, you know, well-spoken, uh, well-written truths in it. Uh, and so, he, but he says to bi biologists, theory is a poor approximation of reality. And to a physicist, it almost seems the reverse. The physicist, the theory, if correct, is what is real. And it's the experimental data that are just a reflection. Um, whereas, you know, as Druben and Oster put it, the culture of the experimentalist dictates that something is only true if you can measure it, right? So there's really this difference in you know, what's the ground truth, right? Is it what you're seeing with your measurements uh, or is it the nice theory that kind of explains it all, even if there's wrinkles in the measurements, right? Uh, and that, you know, I think, you know, especially coming from the physical sciences, you know, that's, there's this gravitation towards simple, neat theories that really hold together lots of things. Uh, and if, if the experiment doesn't quite match it, well, maybe we did the experiment wrong. Uh, whereas I think biologists are more attached to their, um, and, and probably for good reason, right? There's, it's, um, you know, simple models don't explain often things very well in biology. Um, and so, and another person who kind of weighed in on this is Titus Brown, who wrote uh, it, that biology is increasingly integrative rather than reductive. And I think that's, um, that's very true, right? You know, I think there's a push, especially if you look at system biology, there's really a couple strands of it. One strand is, is toward these sort of bigger concepts that, you know, larger 
models that could explain lots of things. But there's also a much, you know, perhaps you know, much more well-funded thread that sees systems biology as collecting more data, like not trying trying hard not to miss anything by making sure that, that we cast as wide a net as possible. Um, and so, you know, and so very many biologists you, you could think of as, as quite detail oriented. You know, biology has given us these really elaborate um, understandings. Well, if you can call it an understanding, but elaborate descriptions of how things work, right? There's, you know, big networks that have lots of different connections. Uh, we can now draw a cell with many of the components in it, even at molecular scale. And, and biologists are pretty, uh, are pretty hesitant to let go of that detail because of, I think, I think in large part, because very often very small details can have huge explanatory power. Uh, you know, one, one missing, one changed amino acid, right, can explain an entire disease, right? And so, you know, I think there's this hesitant, hesitancy to, to, um, to, to say, okay, this, that detail doesn't matter, right? You know, no, nobody wants to sort of, you know, uh, go on record as saying, oh, that, that, you know, that thing doesn't matter, but this one does, right? To a biologist, everything might still matter, right? And so that's why we're collecting more, bigger and bigger data sets and more and more things and, and trawling through them. And so, um, and so in that sense, biology is, you know, it's very, it's very integrated, right? And it's not, so, we haven't really reached the phase where we're trying to take all those things and, and fit them into a more reductive theory, um, you know, more streamlined, simplified theory that, you know, which, which you would find more commonly in physics, right? So I think that to me, that's a crux of um, many of the, the differences, right? Um, and so, but I'd like to hear your opinions on this, right? So, yeah, so if, if you guys would like to jump in with this discussion, I think probably the best way is if you want to raise your hand and I can call on you. Does everybody know how to do the raise hand function? Um, oh, good. Yeah, it should be over on the, it's not not in the correct place for me because I'm the host, but uh, it should be over, I think, over on the right side of your um, uh, of your, your little toolbar. Or if you go to, um, if you go to um, participants, which I'm currently trying to do here, hold on, <laughs> there, there should be a little, you'll have a little raise hand button. Uh, uh, that you can use. So um, yeah, so if you have any thoughts on this, right? So what, you know, what, what differences in mindset have you encountered when communicating with biologists? You know, what do you see as, you know, really a fundamental kind of principal component of what's different between um, uh, the biological fields and uh, either, I guess, the physical or computational fields? Go ahead and jump in if you're ready. Yeah. Be shy. Okay. All right. How about I'll start with a story and maybe that'll get people talking. Sure. Yeah, sounds good, Carol. So one of the things that I find interesting in collaborating with biologists in general mm -hmm. is that um, many times, like like you were saying, John, uh, the, mm -hmm. the the question, the, the data, is a lot, there's a lot of detail in the data, but the questions are not very clearly formed. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was I was trying to collaborate with someone that uh, was at a find your inner modeler meeting a few years ago, and this person wanted to understand how um, they were trying to understand uh, cell division in plants, and so the cell divides and then it forms a cell wall. But because they're rigid, forming the cell wall is actually quite a complicated process, and the, it turns out that the cell wall forms first from the center, and then it spreads out and forms from the center outside instead of from the outside in, which is kind of counterintuitive, right? It's kind of interesting. And so um, one of the questions I said was, well, you know, so when we were talking about the problem, I said, well, we could model the, the, the growth of, since what matters is the two-dimensional, the, 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 the outward growth of the thing, we could just model it as a, as a plane and model the speed at which the thing grows as a plane. And the, and the collaborator was really upset because it was three-dimensional and it was not a plane. And so we had to go back and forth about why a plane was a good a good representation of the system, why the three dimension was important, but it didn't matter for the model. And just having that discussion at that level of what, what was the question and how do we model it? Mm -hmm. That took us like a good two weeks of back and forth to get to the right point. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's the kind of thing where uh, uh, um, the different mindsets that that's an example of a mindset. So, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to open it for others to, to comment. I see that a uh, man has yeah. a sign. Yeah, man, you want to go ahead? Uh, yes. So, um, like, as physicists, we are, like, get used to it that if we have a, like, set configuration of charges, then we have a, like, electrical field. Now, 
if you add another charge in the, in the configuration, you just need to add the effect of this to the previous field, right? But this is, we, I think we, we try to carry out this mindset when, especially like my, my I'm talking about myself, I'm trying to carry out this mindset that, oh, if like this effect is caused by this protein, then just make a mutation and see if it has some effect. But if you tell them like to do this and they might not be super excited about the idea because it's, I mean, it makes sense because there are lots of other different ways that they might use to compensate um, the effect of the mutation. And this is some one, one thing that I, I encountered several times that if you just say that a point mutation, if you even if you do a point mutation and you see a difference, it's not like that. It's like a direct effect. It might be an indirect effect, and this is like what I learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I'm. I think I'm understanding. It. So, like, if you um, sometimes the change that's being made, you know, might have an effect on the protein, but you could it could also have. And I think biologists like to, yeah, I, I've kind of also had this in my own thinking. We like to sort of keep our ex explanations confined to the things we've learned, like how that protein works, right? And it's somewhat uncomfortable sometimes to think about, oh, well, if I, um, if I make that change and it's like you're saying, it, like, let's say it changes the overall charges, that's kind of a mushier explanation that we're less comfortable with, right? And that, that can be yeah, I think that's that, that's a very good insight, right? Is sometimes that's um, that can be a point of resistance for biologists. Um, Jason, you want to go ahead? Yeah. So similarly, there's I guess also a sort of level of extraction where the biologist, the concept is very defined to sort of like genetics or specific area, whereas in more competition areas, every most problems you look at might have another interpretation of it and in a different field. So mm -hmm. it's more abstract in terms of this problem I'm working on might also imagine relate to computer science or just some other theory and some other scientific or information related field mm -hmm. where it's just another form of this other thing that happens in like very different fields and unnecessarily connect mm -hmm. as opposed to something that's more concrete. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. That's a good point. Um, Excellent. Yeah, Charlie, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I was um, uh, I was gonna gonna offer that um, it it can even get more fine grained than the things that we're talking about. That um, differences in methodology can also affect how someone views the information that they have. That someone, you know, one biologist might say that you know, okay, this protein has this effect. And that's because, okay, if you look at a knockout experiment, then you can say that like, okay, this manipulation has this kind of biological output, but that would be very different from what another biologist who's thinking about more of like protein interactions might say about like, what is that protein actually doing? And I think that that's probably like, that's something that is probably going to be a challenge talking, not just to biologists in general, but being aware of what kind of biologist you're talking to mm -hmm. is going to be a barrier to overcome. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. From both your points. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great point is that biologists really differ in their level of abstraction that they're interested in right? from a developmental biologist where, you know, it's, you know, it, it, just the level of knowing which genes are involved, right. You know, versus say like the biophysicist that really wants to talk about, you know, amino acid interactions, right? There's there's different levels of satisfying explanation between those fields. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, those are good points. Um, so yeah, so the bio biologists are yeah, it's <laughs> hard to sum them up in one in one field, right? Because you could be talking about very different things. Um, yeah. I think that um, if, if I can jump in here, mm -hmm. I think one of the big challenges uh, coming from a hard quote unquote hard science tool. To biology and by hard science I mean like you know engineering and, and uh, mm -hmm. physics and things like that is that when you're trained as a physicist and an engineer you're used to um you're used to your models and your data having a one-to-one -one relationship and what mm -hmm. and I talked about this briefly today during the presentation where you know it, it, just to make the, the same example if you have a train leaving a station from one city to the other and you know the speed and you know the distance you have you can plug those things into your model and calculate how long it's going to take mm -hmm. right 
And those are, so your measurements have a very direct relationship with your data. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I find very challenging in, in, in the connection between biology and, and modeling is that the data that you collect is never, is often not directly translatable to the model you're interested in, to the question you're interested in. Mm -hmm. So uh, in biology, we collect, you know, uh, or nominal data, whether it's, you know, did, did the cells, are, are they blue or yellow or red or whatever? Mm -hmm. Or ordinal data, is the Western blood a little bit or a lot more or much, much bigger? Uh, Semi-quantitative data, like, you know, uh, you have a fluorophore and the fluorophore shines, but the relationship is not direct. Or quantitative data, like mass spectrometry. And even with all that data, how you transfer that to a model largely depends on the question you're asking, and that relationship is not very clear. So one of the questions, one of the challenges that I find uh, that, that I think uh, uh, is related to what uh, Jason and Charles were saying is that the, the how informative your data is related to the knowledge that you're interested in is not a very clear relationship. And that's something that we're still just only now starting to understand. And I think that that is one of the big challenges we have in terms of communicating with biologists and, and, and uh, in terms of communication between the two sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Please feel free to argue with me because this is just my, my own view. <laughs> yeah, anybody want to argue with Carlos? <laughs> no, but comments, go ahead. It's, I'm, I'm very open to those things. And did I interrupt someone? Charles, were you going to say something? Yeah. Okay. No, I guess not. Um, yeah, no, I agree. Um, yeah, there's some really good points here. You know, I think, um, and you know, and so, um, yeah, I think, I think we could sum it up by saying, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, there's a lot of, um, there are potentially, there are quite a lot of different things that people, uh, that, you know, that um, are different in, in the way biologists are thinking about things. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I think, yeah, maybe this might be a good time to move on, you know, and kind of get more specific. You know, I think it was sort of, we're sort of touching the surface of what is, um, one moment. Uh, you know, in, in general terms. Go ahead, Daniel, go ahead. Uh, I, one of the things that I most find terrible of talking to biologists is that they never want to compromise. They don't, right? <laughs> they, they feel, okay, give me some, fixed point that I can build something and they they have usually very difficult times saying that. Another thing that they also do, even to create a plot, they usually don't have any idea what even what would be the x-axis and the y-axis. I have to extract that forcefully by questioning every point. So sorry. <laughs> Yeah, and it sounds like it's frustrating. Um, yeah, and it, that's gonna, I think, also going to vary, you know, across biologists too, right? But, um, but yeah, I, I do think um, you can certainly meet a flavor of biologists that's really very focused on things like Western blots, right? You know, and everything is a, you know, is a blot to them, and they, you know, even plotting is, like you're saying, is not something they do routinely and don't have a great, you know, intuitive, um, you know, sense for what how it should be done, right? So, I, yeah, I think this is. Um, and the compromising thing, yes, right. Um, yeah, I, I think in some ways, yeah, may, maybe biologists occasionally get the idea that, or you know, have the, the mindset that, um, you, you, like I was saying before, because there's so much to do, right? I mean, there's not, you know, there isn't, you know, the, the, the priority of a modeling might be lower, right? A, a, a priority of building a model is, is low. And so, you know, if, if they're not that interested, they can just move on and, you know, do some more Western blots, right? So <laughs> this can be, um, yeah, I think challenging. I agree. I agree. Uh, engaging them on that level can, you know, in terms, you know, what's what's valuable for them, right? Is um, it can be hard to sometimes communicate. I think so. Um, yeah, so great. I think that yeah, I think that sort of touches on a lot of you know, everybody's kind of touched on, you know, a number of the, of different things. Um, and I think yeah, it's probably a good idea to move on to our next topic, um, uh, which uh, is basically you know what what have biologists, you know, what were so what um what experience do biologists have with models, right? Uh, and I sort of jokingly, you know, put these two models here, uh, you know, because they're models, right? You know, and these, you know, you, you could argue that these are the models that biologists are, 
you know, when it comes to modeling, this is the kind that they do, right? They build, they build things, right? They build little you know, doodads and cartoons and, you know, with different levels of detail, right? Over on the left, you've got a cell that's got all the organelles in it, um, you know, not at a super high level of detail, but um, on the right side, you've got something with a lot more anatomical detail. Of course, it's a different scale, um, you know, but this kind of thing, I think biologists, um, are, you know, are comfortable with as models, of course, um, most of us are. Um, I think other things that biologists are interested in or you know, are comfortable with are the idea of a model organism, right? And so um, you know, I think it's an important point that biologists, you know, when they say model, they very often mean another animal that um, replicates the thing they're trying to study in a simpler way, right? So for example, the nematode um, is often used as a model for neural system development. Uh, and you know, and you know, of course, no nobody really thinks that a nematode's brain or nervous system is um, is you know is going to be is going to reveal you know exact truths or, or exact you know understandings of a human nervous system, but they're very comfortable with the idea that there's going to be something they gain from that, right? If you study the the worm's nervous system you're going to learn something about the human nervous system in some way, uh, because maybe similar proteins are used, maybe similar you know, uh, structures or processes are, take place during development. And so um, there is a lot of um, confidence in biologists in model systems, right? And model organisms. Um, they're also quite familiar with molecular models. Um, you know, very often, you know, they're, they're very happy to look at these 3D structures and, and, and learn from them. I think everybody understands as a biologist, everybody who's been you know, properly trained even at the undergraduate level knows that these molecular models like this ribbon diagram here, they know that it's not a, uh, an exact replica of the protein, right? They know that there's uncertainty associated with certain regions. They know that you know, this is a static view of a protein and it does not reflect the, the motions that it's making or the, you know, they know that there might be many, hundreds of configurations that are other than the, act, the one that's being shown that are present in a biological system, right? But they're still quite comfortable and, you know, they, in dealing with this and, you know, understanding that. So I do think there is this mindset of, um, you know, of getting value out of models that's, that's there. It's, there is this underlying, you know, foundation that um, the biologists can relate to. Uh, I just think the thing is that when you come, when it comes to quantitative models, they're just much less familiar and much less, um, uh, conversant with how a model works, right? And so, and, and so there's many things, I should, well, there's, I shouldn't say many, there's a handful of things that most biologists have come across uh, in terms of quant actual quantitative models, right? Most people have seen Michaelis Menten and binding equilibria. If they're in neurobiology, they've seen something about the Hodgkin Huxley model. Uh, if they've done any genetics, they've seen uh, population equilibria uh, for, for allele frequencies. If they've done any, any evolutionary ecology, they've seen something about a population growth model. It's just that I think these things don't get used more very often after your initial training. And so you know, typically the fluency with them is lost. And so it's very easy for biologists to kind of grow uncomfortable with what's happening in these and kind of forget, you know, and kind of feel a little bit bad about it too, because they should have known this stuff, but like, you know, it, you have to, you know, you have to kind of drag it back up. So, um, I, I, and I think that was certainly true for me, right? You know, the first time I had to revisit, you know, enzyme kinetics, you know, after undergraduate, I was, you know, I was like, oh, geez, I forgot entirely about that, uh, even though, you know, I learned it, right? So, um, so I think that there are some, there's a foundation here, right? And so that's, that's what I want to point out is that, um, that biologists are uncomfortable with making this, you know, so they'll ascribe to their model organism the ability to be a model, right? The ability to, to reveal truths, you know, that aren't, necessarily congruent, but which are still instructive uh, about them, you know, about a more complex system, right? So going from nematodes to humans, they're okay with that, but it's, they're, they're very often more hesitant to ascribe the same kind of power to a quantitative model, even though nobody would say, you know, none of, none of, the, none of the modelers would say that quantitative model is an exact replica. It's there to be instructive. It's a model, right? And so sometimes just making, you know, that, that parallel idea is, um, is not always apparent to them, right? So, um, so yeah, so that's that that's my take on how models play into the biologist life. Um, I'm curious what you have found um, in your experience. You know what you know what um, what types of model you know, have, have you found a common ground in terms of models uh, and how biologists think about them. And um, 
uh, or, or what do you think might be a, a useful way to connect uh, with a biologist you know, on, in terms of models that they might have seen before or might be familiar with that would help bridge that gap? Does anybody have uh, thoughts on that? Or have you found that biologists just are completely oblivious to models? Go ahead, Hussein. <laughs> yeah, I think I want to answer this to this question based from signaling perspective. And as you showed those diagrams, cartoon diagrams that for all these fields, we put together this interaction of proteins with each other. I feel like uh, I find this common ground that we all put these interactions uh, so like uh, these models driven from pure biological experiments come from, let's say, characterizing a function for this protein, right? And I feel like that's a common ground where we put these models exactly same in the same way. And they are also able to describe, let's say this function for the cell, mm -hmm. but we put it in a way that we, let's say would like to, uh, describe that function in the most quantitative way we would like using this, let's say, keeping track of dynamical concentration of all those the species. Mm -hmm. So uh, one here, one common, I would say, is the way we uh, emphasize what's the function of this protein from either perspective. But the difference is uh, uh, experimental biologists look at that qualitative, if that protein has a function or not based on the assays have been used to characterize those, but uh, we would like to, let's say, look at the more quantitative impact of that. Mm -hmm. And having that kind of summary, even let's say, just consider all the papers we did, all from pure experimental papers, at the mm -hmm. end, we see really nice summary cartoon that shows this interaction, the way this protein goes phosphorylates this, and that does that effect, let's say, on a uh, transmembrane uh, channel protein. So I found that quite common. Uh, biologists mm -hmm. are also, even though studying these complex systems at the end, trying to provide a like simplistic model that with the first look, we can look at it and see what's happening, but more qualitative function of the cells, but we would like to still add more quantitative to that description. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I think that's a very good insight, right? I mean, especially because in some ways you can kind of use the biology, you know, to convince them of, you know, of the, the difficulties here, right? If, if let's say something has been already ascribed like three or four different functions, you know, by different bio, biological studies and papers, right? You could say, well, okay, you know, this, all the, all the biology tells us that it's, that there is more than one thing going on here. How are you going to reconcile those things, right? Um, did you have a good answer for that? Um, and that you know could, could help convince them that you know there's if there's a that, that a model uh, might have a, a more sophisticated answer to that than just um, you know saying well it does all the same things at the same time, right? So um, yeah, th that's a good point. I like that. Um, yeah. Other thoughts here? Wait, did we lose Carlos? Go ahead, John. Go ahead. Maybe we did. I I think one of the shortcomings on the biology side has always been that uh, people have this sense or, or get the sense from when they want to publish their paper mm -hmm. that they have to have a model mm -hmm. to go with it. But mm -hmm. all, they, all that really means to them is that they have a model that fits their data. Mm -hmm. And then this leads to them not asking a question and not trying to use the modeling to rule out other potential models. And mm -hmm. I think so many biologists don't grasp that. And mm -hmm. I think it, it would be great if the modelers, the mathematicians and the physicists can, when confronted with this say, okay, that's great. And now what, what are, other possibilities that we might now explore or you know rule out mm -hmm. or how how might we use this to go forward but i mean oftentimes people just want to get their paper published or their grant and so they want to have some little 
diagram, which looks like what they mm -hmm. want. Mm -hmm. People just use the word in such different ways, as you just illustrated. I mean, one of my one of the people I spend a lot of time with uses the word model to mean the system in which she does her experiments. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's probably the most common yeah, use of it, right, among biologists. Yeah, exactly. And then the second one, that's like you're saying, is the, the thing that goes in figure seven, right? Um, yeah, no, that's, those are great points. Um, and, and, I, and I do think, you know, when perhaps another compelling thing is that, you know, I, you know coming from, you know, uh, Hossein and Jason's lab, for example, um, is, you know, these studies that show, you know, where modeling is used to, to figure out what experiment is most informative, right, in terms of distinguishing things, right? Yeah, that, like, they're saying, like you're saying, you know, if you can show up, you know, prove to a biologist or, you know, at least convince them that you can do that, um, you know, I think very often they, you know, they can see the, the, the value in doing that. Like, is my model exclusive of others? You know, right. um, is it the best model? Right? That's a great point. Um, uh, Anders and I had a, had a great example of that where yeah. in our field, there was a huge argument over whether, uh, I hope I'm not getting beyond people, uh, whether ARCT3 complex worked on the side or at the end of an actin filament. Yep. And Anders and I talked about how we might distinguish those because there were two camps who just would argue with each other endlessly. Uh -huh. And Anders figured out that with the proteins we had on hand, he could devise a set of experiments yeah. that should address this. And so, you know, he he told me what experiments to do and he did them. And of course the answer was, it's it's in the middle, it's it's both. It's, it's along the side with a preponderance for the end. And, you know, neither, neither camp was happy with that. <laughs> it got published. I liked it, but yeah, you know, but, it, but that's, that's really what it, I mean, I, I think the, the power is when you can rule out a model mm -hmm. or when you can choose between models. Right. right. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think your point on publishing papers is also important, right? You know, I think biologists, you know, like the, like papers. I, I don't know. I, I guess I know less about the, the culture in, in say, you know, physics you know, in terms of how papers work and how your career works. Um, but biologists are really tied to their papers, right? Because it moves their career forward, right? And so, you know, they, and they like to get them done as quickly as they can so they don't get scooped and, you know, um, yeah, I think corners get cut a lot intellectually, right? At, at that stage, right? Because, um, you know, the grad student needs to move on, right? So, um, it, it, which is a natural thing to think, right? So, um, you know, to worry about. Um, but it's important. Um, all right, uh, do we, do great comments. Uh, do, does anybody have any other um, other thoughts here before we maybe move on to the next topic? These are all great points. Okay, good. Um, all right, let's see here. Uh, and, and this is one that we've kind of already touched on a bit, right? You know, is this idea that that biologists are really themselves quite diverse, right? It's not necessarily fair to you know, paint them all with the same brush because they come with very different sets of training. They care about very different things. Uh, there's, um, you know, everything from biophysics to tissues, uh, things like biochemistry, cancer biology. They all have their own sort of ecosystems of, you know, what's known and what's important and what, you know, what people care about. Um, and so that's, that's important, right? Um, and, 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 you know, I think if you look at what's been done in these fields, you know, I find it even hard to draw a real catalog for the impact of, uh, of modeling, but you can say that, I mean, certainly in these fields that I'm listing here, some modeling has been done, right? Um, you know, actin dynamics, for example, like John was just talking about, um, gene expression, population biology, you know, visual phototransduction. Some of these fields have very deep, uh, you know, deep histories of building models. Um, I would say there's also quite a lot of variation in how deeply those models have kind of taken root and, and you know, really been used. You know, I think sometimes, you know, for, for example, in cell death, which is a field that Carlos and I worked in, um, it, there was a, a strain of labs, you know, that were, you know, actively building models of caspase activation and, you know, building on top of each other's models. And, you know, I think the, the models really facilitated some back and forth, you know, between ideas um, and, you know, which model was more correct. And, you know, I thought a lot of it was healthy, at least at the time that I was following the field. I've kind of lost track of it because I moved on, but, um, but it was healthy, right? But the thing was that the mainstream of the field 
uh, never really cared or accepted it, right? You know, they, <laughs> you know, they, you know, the, the, the biologists, you know, sort of, um, you know, either just, you know, didn't believe it, you know, we heard, you know, some very rude comments at meetings about like, who cares, uh, you know, and, and in, in, in general, what happened was the field just, most of the biologists, you know, got tired of, um, of cast bases and moved on to, um, you know, the field kind of shift, it shifted in terms of what it cared about and cast bases became kind of, less interesting and, you know, autophagy became more interesting. So, you know, fitting, you know, in terms of how, how models impact things, um, there's a lot of variation, right? But, um, but certainly, you know, most, there are many fields, you know, it's, it might be, it might be fairly difficult to find a field at this point where no modeling has been done, where there's no, you know, there's literally zero papers on some kind of model, right? There probably usually is, right? Because I think, you know, there's been quite a lot of computational scientists with interests and in, in, you know in find in, in building building into new areas and so that's been you know done quite um, you know quite a lot over the last 20 years or so so um, so there are you know there is a lot going on right uh, I guess I'm curious you know maybe you know, describing your field and what's been done in your field um, how far along is the modeling right you know are the are you know are there existing models that people take seriously? Is it really kind of out of the fringe and it's new? Um, or has it been going on for a long time, but it's still at the fringe? Um, and, and, you know, what, what looks new and interesting? You know, what do you see as being like the next um, steps in that area? So those are, um, those are kind of the discussion topics. Anybody like to um, contribute or jump in their ideas? Just, I, I think people know about this, but yeah. in, in cell biology, in general, there's this great set of, there's this great tool that was built by Les Loeb at, at, at Connecticut, which really has a low barrier, low activation energy for people who don't know anything to get mm -hmm. into it. So I think there has been a lot of mm -hmm. push and pressure, like I said, for people to make a model for their paper, but, but I mean, to be fair, people then get sucked into this tool, this system mm -hmm. that Les put together. Mm -hmm. And then I think they really get more excited about it. So I think making, uh, you know, I'm sure that the modelers are always torn between, should I just do this for the person or should I teach them how to do it? Uh -huh. And it's never exactly clear what the right answer is. But in this case, you know, Les really wanted to make a tool that mm -hmm. everybody else could use. And I think that's that's been really useful. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, that has been a useful tool. And I think, I think a lot of people have played with it, right? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Other, um, other th yeah, other experiences, I guess, in terms of what was, what's your field like and what's the modeling landscape look like in your field? Jason, you wanna go ahead? I had a quick little different question about essentially where I thought the landscape should go. Mm -hmm. Whereas I've seen some of it done where essentially more graphical interfaces where it's more easy to, to build models. Mm -hmm. That way, like ideally, like you don't want it to be where they have to know how to program or do math. Because mm -hmm. biologists tend to, I guess, be visually in terms of what's interacting. So like mm -hmm. having some sort of graphical interface, we can do that. Mm -hmm. But also having in sort of way where it's more easy to like, visualize what are the inputs going into that and sort of like making it easier essentially like how do I calibrate my model how mm -hmm. do I convert my data in a format that's useful for the model that way there's some either a software package or set of packages that are much easier for them to connect to where they can build the model and start testing you know different experiments different conditions mm -hmm. with their data and that way they can like more reasonably you know get something out of it versus like all the time they need to invest in learning how to do all this new stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, having tools like that, um, yeah, I guess, Carlos, you'd say probably PySB is sort of, in some ways, geared towards being a tool like that, right? It, yes, uh, John, PySB is the future and everyone yeah. should use it. Uh, no, but I think that, uh, that this idea of, uh, you know, how does knowledge grows with information and with data and, and being able to maintain these things. So I think that I mean, the reason we did PiSV is because that's the that's what computer scientists have been doing for a long time, and and that paradigm works really well. So you know, and you know, Jason, you're right here at Vanderbilt. So if you ever want help with PiSV, let us know. 
And by the way, sorry that I disappeared. at and decided they needed to do a reboot for the area's routers or something. And then Zoom decided to update. So it took me 10 minutes or something to get back. Sorry about that. No worries. Yeah, Daniel, Daniel, I'm curious about your field. Um, Cause you see, I mean, you had some interesting experience, experience with biologists, working with biologists. What, um, what, um, what does the modeling landscape look like in the field that you're working in? Only now it's so these that people are using. There is a lot of um, will to use machine learning, but no one seemed to have done anything <laughs> interesting with that, especially because when we get to them and say, okay, so you want to have machine learning, you need, you know, you need a lot of data to uh, uh -huh. go, go completely sideways. But uh, basically, yes, it's so these that, that we are using more. Now I see also a very, very big use of agent-based models. And I am very, very happy about that because I think they are the way. We don't know how to prove anything with them, but I think they are very useful <laughs> eventually. Yeah. Yeah, I, I should point out, yeah, you make a good point there that biologists do love uh, new tools, right? You know, if it's mm -hmm. new and, and shiny, uh, like machine learning, um, you know, they, they, they you know, and they sense that there's something, you know, useful they can get out of it. They will, uh, yeah, they, um, they'll be all over that. <laughs> they love things like that. Yeah, if it turns out to be hard, then they get upset, right? <laughs> they eventually get upset, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, I think that that's why uh, going back to what I was saying earlier, you know, understanding what is the question and is your data supporting the question is key, right? Yeah. It doesn't be, it doesn't make sense to do machine learning on two data points. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it, it, and it's not it's never a substitute for like real intellectual, you know, um, you know, reckoning with with a with a question, right? So, um, but sometimes biologists do like I mean, I, you know, speaking from experience. I think in part because it is so hard to get to a paper. People want things that will speed up their, um, you know, the paper they can write, you know, um, get to a paper faster. So, um, okay, take care, Hussein. Um, we'll see you soon. Um, all right, yeah, it's a good, those are some good points. Anybody else have other things? Uh, we could probably take a break coming up here. If anyone, any closing thoughts here about, um, you know, what's going on in your field, things you, you've seen. I guess maybe, maybe one of the, what do you think if, if, in people's experience, what is what field in biology would you say is the most um, advanced in terms of you know, having a model, model, a thriving model, modeling thread that kind of goes along with the, uh, the experiments and kind of has a nice back and forth. Anybody, anybody have any thoughts on what's the shining example? I mean, it could be acting, honestly. I mean, it's one of the, you know, biggest ones, I think. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I was going to expand it to say sort of cell motility. I mean, there's there's a muscle person who works across all from me, you yeah. know, and he puts mutations and then does molecular biophysics and then does cell culture experiments. And he has a model which, ta which takes him through each step. Mm -hmm. So, and the point being that they want to be able to explain the end from the beginning Mm -hmm. And so for new mutations, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, this, this field has been quantitative and predictive for a long time, almost since, since it started. But I guess I would say that the signaling and sort of protein interaction field is, has really been exploding. Even, yeah. with, even with machine learning, which I was going to joke, the, the people down the hall from me who do computational biology they have a hard time knowing what machine learning is too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that um, one of the things that I find very inspiring is to look at other areas that have the same types of problems that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, PyDream, which is uh, getting a lot of attention uh, with a tool that we, we just essentially, we didn't even write it. We just ported it from a crappy Fortran code, no offense to the Fortran coders, uh, John, <laughs> but it was an old Fortran code <laughs> to a more modern Python implementation. And we just published SnapNode on it. And all of a sudden this idea of using uh, a parallelizable um, 
parameter inference tool became really useful. And people in hydrology have been doing this for decades, right? So parameter inference for large underdetermined models. Um, ecology is another field that because they don't come at it from first principles, we don't understand the chemistry and the physics of an ecosystem. They have approached it with um, more humility. <laughs> and so they, they've they started from the beginning knowing that we don't know a lot. And so I think that in biology, the paradigm of, you know, we come from chemistry, we know the structure of these proteins. And so therefore now we're gonna understand their interactions. And at some point when you go up and up and up in scales, you start losing you start losing knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that concept is very hard for us as biologists, but in, 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 in climate modeling and in, uh, in, in ecology and things like that, that's a very, they, they're very comfortable with that uncertainty and dealing with that uncertainty of, of you know, a measurement and what it really means and all that stuff. So, um, I think that uh, in terms of what fields have a lot of computational uh, advance, you know, genomics in general, you know, sequence alignment, blast, things like that, they're so mature. But then I think that we're also missing a lot because we think that our data says more than it does. And I think that that's the part where we don't understand the, the limits yet. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, I would encourage, you know, the young people, uh, look at ecology, look at, look at uh, hydrology, look at... Uh, so one of the things that amazed me uh, during the epidemic, uh, so there was the American model, the European model, and uh -huh. the Japanese model. And the fields are so mature that there were basically three major models and they were and the communities were working around this big, under, this consensus understanding of the process, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, as you were saying, John, um, even unifying people in our field about growth or flagellar development or cell death, it would take years and it would be so complicated and so difficult to get everyone on the same page. And mm -hmm. that is something that we're lacking because I think we're lacking that much. Mm -hmm. But Carlos, do, don't you think the big problem in biology is the scale? Because if you look at epidemiology or ecology, the scale is more or less set, right? But no. when you go into biology, you have so many different scales that you can do the, the, the modeling. And that's usually at least for me, one of the problems. <laughs> sure. So I think that you're right in that scales are a problem in biology, but they're also a problem in other fields. So for example, the climate modeling people, they have to deal with the dynamics of the weather in the whole world and also deal with the dynamics of the weather in a pond in, in, in Southern New York. Mm -hmm. And how do these things talk to each other? Mm -hmm. And it's actually quite interesting that at the, the, they still cross, you know, three to six orders of magnitude in space and time, and they still cross, you know, they still deal with multi-scale processes actually in the, in the, in the order of centuries, right? Uh, um, millions of years. Yet at the same time, the harder part that, that is actually where they school us is that they can't do experiments. They just measure data and infer mechanisms um, because they kind of go and explode the volcano five times and see if it always explodes the same way. And so, for example, one of the coolest studies I've seen is, um, how does the local explosion of a volcano in a town affect all of Earth a century later? And it was fascinating because, because the, the, the change in space and time was orders of magnitude, but you know the modeling was actually very similar. It would be kind of akin to saying, okay, how does gene expression affect uh, cellular population behavior? And it's again, you have a, a microscopic behavior that affects uh, something a little bit more microscopic. So I think the question, so I think, again, this is my, my own perspective, I think it's not so much the scale, it's about the question. What is the problem that we're interested in? Because if you're talking about, you know, for example, cell identity, how do you go from a pluripotent stem cell to a differentiated cell? And how do you do you change the transcription factors and turn them on and off and all these things? I think that it's about the process and not so much about the scales. And I think that casting those questions from, uh, this is a, a molecular process to, or, or sorry, we are care, we're carrying, we only care about the molecular level detail to, we care about this one process. I think that that's a, a more relevant way of looking, a, a more useful way to look at it, I think, for, at least from a modeling perspective. And maybe I'm wrong. And again, you know, this is my, this is now philosophy. So, you know, so I could be wrong, but, but I think you get out to a very good point that, that scale makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And, and you're in Georgia Tech. We, you could come over and we can talk more. I'll buy you coffee. <laughs> Where are you? 
Yeah. I'm in the international at Vanderbilt. Oh, okay. And oh. John, you too, you're in Missouri, right? That's not so far. <laughs> Yeah, you need a, a Southern Midwest modeling uh, meeting once. Um, yeah. yeah, we just don't need any more unvaccinated people coming to visit us. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> we have enough of them. They come to our hospital. Thankfully, hey, we, we all got vaccinated already. <laughs> yeah. no, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, did, I, did I miss somebody? Do you have any? Um, Ming Zhang, yeah. come in. Oh, we left. Oh, you go. Um, yeah, apparently, just, yeah. Anyway, whatever, whatever it was. We just, anyway, um, okay. So let's, um, yeah, let's take a quick break since um, you know we've got we have about forty five minutes left on the clock until the, you know, till the next you know thing is over. Or until actually, I'm not even sure what's next on the agenda. I forgot to look. Um, <laughs> This is it. Right? This is the last thing. This is it, yeah. John. yeah, this yeah. is it. Yeah, so I guess we're not in a big hurry, right? Uh, but yeah, we will try to end on time at five. Um, but I think, I think, um, yeah, why don't we take a minute if you need to use the restroom, it's uh, or get a new cup of coffee, like myself. Um, and um, yeah, I'll leave you with my favorite uh, biologist physicist cartoon here. Um, so why don't we come back in? Start up at four twenty. You guys want to? May, may, I, you know, may I pose a question to everyone for when we come back, if you don't mind, John? Yeah, go for it, yeah. So one of the things that I've been, so the traditional paradigm is that teaching quantitative trained people biology is easier than the other way around. But I actually have started to, to question that. And I've been wondering, what would be the foundation math and statistics we could teach biologists so that we can accelerate this, this, mm -hmm. this back and forth process? And so mm -hmm. think about that while, while you're taking a break, but I think that we need that. And I think we're, it's actually not as hard as it sounds. Yeah, yeah so, that's a great question. Good, all right, yep. Well, see you all in five minutes. Yeah. Five minutes, okay. Yep, 420.
Hey, John. Um, hey, Carlos. Yeah, I had the same thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, great. This is a great cartoon, by the way. I, I just, yeah, it never gets old. <laughs> the other, the other, the other brilliant XKCD, if you've ever seen it, is the one called The Difference. And it's, it's got, um, you know, somebody touches this handle, it's, you know, it's electrified and they get a shock. And then, it, it, you know, there's a branch and it says, normal people, scientists, right? And the, yes. you know, the no normal person's like, oh, guess I shouldn't do that. And the scientist is like, I wonder if that happens every time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. My wife reminds me of that, like, yeah. I, I tend to hurt myself a lot, you know, on on little experiments like that. So, yeah. Uh, Daniel, have, you, okay. Yeah, uh, no, I was just gonna say that I have, uh, you know, I have young kids, and uh, one of them has the mindset of a scientist. Like one of them actually breaks things and then tries again to see if it will happen again and the other one is not so you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah no i i think i've definitely i've got three and it's like it's i also see that sort of spread <laughs> like one person like you know he'll ask the same question like several times like <laughs> you know look at you either looking for more you know more detail or just wants to know if you answer the same thing twice, right? You know, and if you, if you give them the, if you give different answers. Right, right. Yeah, they take statistics. They're, they're, they're naturally statistically inclined. Kids are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Oh, Ed, Daniel's got one here. Hold on, let's see what it is. Oh, yeah. Which one's this one? <laughs> what yeah, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> philosophists would be all the way to the right. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. Why is there, yeah, yeah. hey guys, yeah, metaphysics, yeah, yeah, all right, let's see, well, we're still waiting, I suppose five minutes is ambitious, but yeah. some people are coming back. Do you guys don't feel that when we finally, if, when it is easy to build a model of something in biology, the model is not needed anymore because the thing is very, very well known. So mm -hmm. we only get to build the model when everything is very blurred and <laughs> difficult. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, because that's really like the point of a model, right? Is to help make things clear when it's like too, you kind of like the model is like a way of encapsulating one set of ideas that might be true mm -hmm. when other ones, you know, but there, you know, there's plenty of equally, at least on the face of it, equally compelling ideas. And, you know, the, you know, the idea would be, you know, can you help figure it out? Yeah, it's like the point is once it gets easy, then you don't need it, right? Maybe it's, Yeah, when you have all the parameters and all the information, yeah, well, yeah. just okay, let's build a model just to finalize the thing and move yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, fine, yeah, yeah, and, and I, you know, I personally, I like when model, you know, you know, I, I think in biology, at least there is a, there's a lot there for a while. There were a number of biology modeling papers that would kind of go along the lines of, uh, look, we modeled it, and then look how well it fits everything, right? And 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 then the paper is over, right? And to me, that was always very unsatisfying, as opposed to like a paper where like, okay, we made the model as a, according to what everybody thinks. And here's something that does not fit, you know, and it, you, and you the model really identified like a gap, right? You know, something that was, you know, mm -hmm. it pointed to like what we don't know, right? So yeah, I agree. I think you know, it, it, so even when things appear well done, you know, complete, you know, maybe models still have something to say if if they don't fit right? um, potentially, but um, if they can reveal that. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm I'm sorry that I just walked back in, but that's yeah. that's exactly right. And the problem is like. The editor at Nature is not going to publish that paper. <laughs> you know, it's like you have to have discovered something, and no, that you can't have discovered that we don't know something. Yeah. I mean, I just, you know, I, th I think we should just we should just publish everything in bio archive and 
the the NIA should refuse to pay page charges to any journal. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm kind of on board. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's really I'm so happy you mentioned that because um, I find that um, so I, I feel like when it comes to publishing, right, uh, either you have a lot of data, like the paradigm is you make you have data, you make a prediction and then you validate the prediction. And if you and if you have that paradigm, then, you know, you're, you're, the editor will give uh, will pay attention to you. Mm -hmm. and, and I got into a pretty it was not a heated argument, but it was a, it was kind of a, a, an energetic argument. Because I was saying, look, you know, you can collect all the data you want, but if your data is not informative, you're not advancing the field, even though you're you're following that that paradigm. And I said, we need more theory. We need theory that explains what we have, so that we know where to go. And editors are very resistant to this idea. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we've had a really hard time publishing some papers, but we've had some some successes. So you know, I'm hoping that this is just carving a hole that if we keep at it long enough, we'll we'll eventually you know get these messages out, but, you know, and this is my argument, you know, we can do a single salary seek as much as you want, but until we understand what that data really means for the questions we're asking, mm -hmm. it's not going to be informative. You know, it's not going to move the field forward if we just collect more of the same data that's not useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I agree. Yeah, it's, it is, that is quite the conundrum. And yeah, we really seem stuck in that. Yeah, let's, let's generate a huge data set and, and, um, and this is preaching to the choir here, you know, but it is, still. yeah. Uh, anyway, so yeah, great. Glad to see everybody's back. Um, let's. We didn't lose anyone. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. What do we have here? Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna step forward. Okay, there we go. Um, okay. Yeah. So the last, the last few things are, you know, as I was saying before, you know, geared towards, you know, what things can you do, in, you know, practically in a collaboration with biologists. Um, that are useful or uh, yeah, help push things forward. Um, and so one of them, of course, uh, this is kind of a longer quote, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but it really gets at this idea of um, something John said earlier, which is you know, there are some questions that a modeler or a physicist might ask that are uh, very often things that you know, the biologist hasn't thought of, like things like how many molecules are in that, right? Or you know, uh, you know, what, what are the thermodynamics of that? Where does the energy come from? Where does the, um, you, know, you, know, you know, is this that steady state or is? And so, yeah, very often biologists haven't thought about it. And so, um, the and if they're thinking biologists, hopefully, you know, ones that are, you know, that really want to understand the system, you know, these questions when you ask them can be quite uh, penetrating, right? They can really be like, oh, okay, that's you know, that's a very important question that we have never touched, right? So, um, so there's that. Um, I would say uh, a couple of other things that came up that are useful uh, is you know, a fairly simple quote, but you know, don't forget that you bring some unique um, expertise and skills uh, to the problem as a, as a modeler, right? I mean, you might not know a lot in terms of the, the, the foundation of you know, all the data um, and all you know, what's in the field, but you've got some very useful, unique things, right? So that's, you know, we should, you know, I think, as, as a computational modeler, you shouldn't feel too you know, intimidated about coming to a biologist and, and asking questions, right? Because you are bringing something uh, valuable, even if, they, even if they don't know it. <laughs> um, and then of course, you know, this idea that as we've kind of touched on before is that, you know, what is understanding, right? It, op it operates on different planes um, and you know, what's, what people want is, is often quite different. And so, um, you know, just questioning that, what, what do we want, can often be quite useful. Um, right, so you know, the, yeah, this last set of things will be a little on the shorter side because we're, you know, we're getting you know, further along here. Uh, we have a half an hour left. Um, so, but yeah, what questions have you found to be helpful when, you know, what have, that have triggered um, you know, thinking uh, in, in the biologists that you're, that you're interacting with? Um, you know, or, or, you know, or what would you like to ask, you know, alternatively, if you haven't really had a lot of experience with, with doing that. Um, any, I do like the, how many molecules are in that? Hello, Belinda, how you doing? <laughs> I always like, Hello. what, I mean, to try to not be confrontational or like accusative, I, I'm mm -hmm. always like, you know, what else could there be? And the, the way that I like to phrase this is in terms of like the yeast genome, you know, there's like 5,000 genes approximately. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's 
probably like a few few hundred for the action cytoskeleton, but I really only know about like 10 things. And so to ask someone, you know, what else might be going on? Now, you then run the risk of them saying, I can't possibly deal with this. Don't, don't even ask me this question. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's the way to phrase it is, what are there interesting possibilities that might be added to this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That's often within the mindset of a biologist. You know, so, you know, as we said before, you know, they want to not miss things, right? You know, they want to, they don't want to miss an important explanation. Yeah. Those back orders, orders Hello. Orders, uh, I'm the Jay. I'm just a grad student, so I don't mm -hmm. know if I'm allowed to. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, yeah. So it's open discussion. Go ahead, BJ. In the future. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but I was just going to say that. Um, when I was an undergrad, I remember uh, uh, the way that they taught us, uh, I studied biochemistry and the way that they taught us cell biology was, oh yeah, everything boils down to sterics and diffusion. So this is the physics that you need to understand. So then that's the kind of question that I usually pose to people is, so what is your steric model and why, and how does it work? And why do you think diffusion is working in this way and how? And, what is it? <laughs> and then if you just ask that, usually you can have an interesting uh, conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, I agree. That, that's a great insight. Good. I was actually going to, uh, I would love to hear more about what you think, Vijay, because one of the hardest things, and you know, I'm, I'm faculty now and all this stuff. One of the hardest things to explain to people or to ask for when I'm talking with a biologist is explaining fundamental concepts. You know, like you said, like diffusion. Or like, for example, I oftentimes with my biological uh, collaborators, uh, they say things like, oh, A binds to B. And I'm like, yeah, but there's a, there's like an equilibrium there. And, yeah. and, and some of it is going to be unbound and some of it is going to be bound and the equilibrium matters. And, and so this getting across these fundamental questions is really hard. So do you have any, any ideas of how you communicate, you know, fundamental things like that? Uh, and, and everyone so just, you know. Yeah, I mean, for for I for me, usually what I do is just um, in the. I shouldn't even say usually what I do. I I've been working on one paper, so. <laughs> but in the course of that paper, what has happened uh, several times is I'll uh, express uh, I'll express a doubt on theoretical mm -hmm. grounds, and then usually the reception is pretty bad uh, because people are sort of like, well, look, like we know how this works and, you know, you're just sort of walking in here with some fancy math and okay, whatever. Um, yeah. And then, and then what I have done in the course of the paper is take data uh, generated by the biologists and analyze it and then show, hey, look, there's evidence for, there, there's reason to consider that we don't completely understand whether it's, you know, in your example, uh, uh, you know, Professor Lopez, whether it's, you know, a binding constant or a model of a binding constant or whatever it is, um, there's reason to think that, hey, that's actually something worth uh, understanding with some theoretical care because it can actually uh, have ramifications for the biological conclusion, if not deductive, uh, uh, to, you know, uh, and it's not a matter for deduction. So, um, yeah, uh, that's that's been more or less how it goes. That I sort of mm -hmm. read some math, say, "Hey, this is interesting." People say, "Usually, it's not." Turns out, most of the time, it's not. And every so often, I'll do an analysis and I'll say, "Okay, okay there's something there." Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, sometimes you kind of have to make the case, right? You have to, you know, kind of bring all, bring all the evidence and. Um, yeah, convince them. Yeah, and I, I agree with your point about diffusion too. Right? I mean, I think very often biologists um, you know, either neglect the diffusion or kind of, you know, like, um, you know, but but we know it's there, right? You know, and if somebody really says no, no, because of diffusion, you know, you have to, you're going to have to not think that all, you know, literally every, you know, you know, R two three is bound to an actin, right? There's got to be some unbound, right? You know, it's there's got to be a back and forth, right? And so. Um, you can convince you know, if you, well, yeah. So I like your point of making your case, though. I think that's, that's important. Yeah. Good. Um, let's see. 
Are there any thoughts here? Anybody else on that? Oh, the cat. I like your cat, Charles. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the other, so uh, uh, again, you know, concepts like, uh, I'll just to mention another one, stochasticity. So I think that, that in biology, not you, John, but many people think that everything's deterministic and everything has a very clear path. But stochasticity is very present, especially at the chemical level or at the cell population level. Not all cells respond the same. And this idea of where does stochasticity come from? I feel like those are hard concepts to, to discuss and to, to, I don't know. I, I, I would love to have a better, under, a, a way to explain these concepts you know, in a more straightforward way. I'm, I'm not very good at it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, there, you know, for example, I'm thinking in our field, like the, the signaling, um, you know, people, you know, there, there are experiments that kind of show how signaling, you know, it has to be stochastic, right? Um, you know, and sometimes, you know, if you, you know, you have to, you know, kind of bring, you know, sort of hit people with that, um, that kind of idea before, you know, and really, um, you know, you know, like if there's a good biological experiment, you um, that explains uh, or that it shows that there has to be stochasticity, right? That you know that's um, um, I think you know th th an important starting point sometimes. So um, good. I was just thinking. So yeah, do we? Um, yeah, maybe real quickly. I just uh, VJ and um, and Belinda. Could you, uh, since we didn't get a chance to you know uh, hear about you early on, could you um, just give a quick intro to who you are and uh, what what field you're working in and what um, what your background is? Sure. Uh, yeah, good, Belinda. Yeah. Um, Belinda Akba, I am a chemical engineer by training. Um, had a long, interesting path that did not start off with researching anything biological or computational, but now run a research program in computational biology. <laughs> Charlie has the great misfortune to be a member of my research group. Um, I study a whole bunch of different types of biological problems from things related to drug discovery and systems pharmacology to plant physiology to forensic anthropology. Um, what they have in common is that they are typically questions for which there isn't a huge amount of data and there will never be a huge amount of data. Mm -hmm. And so I'm interested in working closely integratively with biologists to think about given our limited ability to acquire data um, what do models suggest is the most profitable experimental strategy and how do we most quickly learn about what's happening in these complex systems? Awesome, great. Yeah, sounds good. And what are you doing? Uh, hi, so I'm a, a PhD student uh, entering my uh, fifth year uh, in um, in uh, development in biology. I'm in a development lab. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, um, I, I guess I'm interested in two things, which I've been struggling to, to do, given the constraints of I don't do experiments. So I just work with the data that other students generate, which is, you know, good, because there's data to analyze, but uh, bad because I don't just get to say, hey, wouldn't this be neat to think about and proof the data is there. Um, but the two things I'm interested in are, on the one hand, there are some researchers who have um, devoted effort to thinking about um, mechanisms in development from a computational standpoint. So they try to argue that, they try to argue and they kind of get out in front of what we can biochemically understand mechanistically, but they try and argue, hey, look, the cell is actually, or these this aggregate of cells or whatever it is, uh, they're actually uh, following a list of instructions. <laughs> okay, which is a kind of simple computational operation, but uh, pretty hard to explain in terms of a biochemical mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one thing I'm very interested in. And the other thing I'm interested in is, I guess, um, taking uh, notations uh, um, from uh, physics, really from theoretical physics, and seeing if they actually have more profitable application in theoretical biology. So for example, um, gauge symmetries are something that people talk a lot about in physics, but they're actually not very useful. So if you talk mm -hmm. to an engineer, uh, unless you're working on you know, a fancy TV, maybe, 
uh, a gauge symmetry doesn't matter that much. Um, there are some cases where it matters, but usually it's not a big deal. On the other hand, and certainly, if you're talking to a biologist, if you say gauge symmetry, you've lost them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, yeah, that's that's my everyday life is just sort of bracketing and translating and all that business. Um, but in the case of a developmental system, uh, where we take for granted that the cell doesn't know, so to speak, in biologies, uh, everything it needs to know to develop. Uh, Notationally, it's very natural to say, oh, it's not just apical, basal, dorsal, ventral, and so on. Just It's not just these coordinates, but that there are local coordinates that have to do with what's internal to the cell. And it's very natural notationally to think about that in terms of a gauge. But that also poses problems uh, uh, biophysically in terms of how the, this is realized since we have a, a kind of uh, chemical or biochemical uh, basis to, to work on. Um, so anyways, that's the sort of thing I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah, no, I think it's yeah, kind of exactly the, um, the thing where, you know, the, the, you, yeah, you're, 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 you're our target audience here. <laughs> um, great. Uh, yeah, nice, nice to meet you both. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, yeah, so the, um, yeah, as we move into like the last two topics we're going to talk about, um, yeah, the, you know, again, touching on what's important um, when interacting with a biologist um, is this, you know, this thing of um, becoming very familiar with the data that's available, right? Sometimes, uh, like you're saying, Belinda, it might be, um, maybe there's not a lot of data available, and, uh, but other cases, you know, we're talking about piles of data, right? Um, and so, you know, it's you, typically a biologist will really, you know, I think respond to somebody who really understands, uh, or, or, you know, is, I should say, um, is conversant with all the data and has, you know, is been able to um, maybe not memorize all of it, but at least has seen it and is really engaged with it. Um, and, you know, and this is important because this is what biologists do is, you know, they read lots and lots of papers. Those papers often, uh, there's a lot of nuances in them. You know, they take a lot of, um, effort to really kind of internalize, you know, what was in figure 4B, which is, you know, it's not in the abstract, but, you know, there's, there might be something really crucial there. Uh, and biologists love this, or this is kind of our, you know, our currency is, you know, knowing about all the little noodles and, and, and uh, uh, strange things that have happened. Uh, and, and so for, for a model, it's, you know, it's, this is something that's important to do too, if you're really going to engage with a, um, you know, in a, biological problem is to understand the, what's known, right? So um, with that in mind, right, I mean, how, it, I'm curious about your experiences. Have you found it challenging to, you know, internalize all that data, um, especially, you know, given the way that it's often, you know, not organized in, in papers? Uh, uh, and what have you found to be major obstacles? And have you found a good, good approaches to, you know, kind of, you know, engaging with the, the literature and the existing data? Um, yeah, go ahead and Feel free to contribute if you'd like. Yeah. For me, the most I would thing, sorry, Vijay, so, yeah. go for it. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. I was just going to say yes, no, study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those, yeah, one word answers are good. Yeah, um, yeah good points. Uh, Daniel, I'm going to go ahead. For me, the most difficult thing was proteins. Mm. The acronyms kill me every uh, time. Yeah. <laughs> they should have a better way of identifying those stuff. Yeah, that's that's an outstanding point, right? You know, and we, yeah, we we're, we're very hesitant to give up names, you know, just because you know it might be named for, you know, in, in some. Very silly way, but yeah, there's yeah, it's yeah, I suppose you know, C. Elegance, the C. Elegance field has kind of been the most um, maybe I don't know what's the right way to say mil militant about it, you know, where <laughs> like no, you can pretty crazy too. What's that? Drosophila is pretty crazy too. Just well, Drosophila, I feel like Drosophila is literally the other end of the spectrum. It's like you get to name it whatever you think it looks like, right? And <laughs> looks like a hippopotamus, <laughs> it's hippo, great. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah no it's yeah it's unfortunate i don't know um i don't know if anybody's um 
you know, I think there's lots of different tastes, right? You know, I think some people like the craziness because then it's a little more, um, you know, there's more of a mnemonic, mnemonic there than there is if it's just three letters and a number, right? Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it, it is tricky though, it really is. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't have any good suggestions there, unfortunately. <laughs> other, other thoughts? Things that are hard uh, or useful uh, either way. I find that I have to ask lots of questions to get at where the data comes from and what it actually represents. So you can give me multiple mm -hmm. data sets on a particular protein, mm -hmm. but if it's from an in vitro experiment versus an ex vivo experiment versus in vivo, intact, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are different assumptions that go around the kind of model that you can build that appropriately integrates that data. And so explaining why I need to know mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. is something that uh, yeah, I have to put some effort into. Yeah, you know, I agree. And that's an excellent point is, I mean, that, the data are really tied to the metadata of how, what, what was the experiment that led to this? And do we, you know, was it a good experiment? Was it done properly? You know, what, you know, what were all the, uh, what are the limits of it? And these are all there. And, you know, kind of a related thing is, you know, very, you know, I, I I often find this with grad students, like they'll come to me and be like, oh, look, I found this paper, um, you know, that says this. And I'm like, oh, no one believes that one. It's, you know, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's not a, yeah. Uh, don't, don't, don't bother your time with that. That was, that was, a, that was a mess, right? Uh, and it can be hard to, you know, it, it can take a long time to develop that. Um, or I mean, sometimes you, you can't just know on the face of it, right? The paper looks fine on the face of it, but it's just that, you know, there's under, oh. you know, Everybody else in the field has tried to replicate it and they can't, you know, and that's, you know, so there's, there's that problem as well. So just to add to the, to the problems, right? So, um, but yeah, I, I think that's one of those points is really great that, you know, you, you can't just treat everything like it's a, you know, Excel file full of, you know, yes or no's, right? It, there's, there's a provenance issue, right? Of where does that data come from? What is it? I, I just wanted to add uh, for, for VJ and others that are, that are still young. Um, <laughs> Everyone in my lab has made, so first of all, I, I, I require that everyone spend some time in a lab, six months to six months to a year, at, the LS, at least six months, just do a Western plot on your own, just because it opens your mind about what it takes, right? And grow the cells, purify the cells, do something with them. Um, and then the other thing is that pretty much everyone that's gone through my lab has made a comment at some point that they didn't realize that modeling meant knowing all the experiments and all the data and understanding all these things and where they come from. And so there's, you know, you, you can't possibly know all the techniques. And it's like, yes, you're going to have to, because you need to understand what data you have before you model it. And I think, uh, um, Belinda, I, I agree. I, I've, I've had gone through that so many times. Uh, when we started a project with mass spectrometry people, I needed to learn about all the different modes of mass spectrometry because that's the only way I can understand the data. And there's no way around it. Yeah, yeah, excellent points. Good. Have you found, um, uh, uh, and this question for Linda, but also for everyone, how about the other way around? Is there a good approach to to sharing your your results with biologists when you make you know complex analysis? So you know, for example, um, I find that explaining heat maps and things like that always takes multiple meetings. <laughs> I mean, um, I'm actually kind of curious if Charlie would be happy with me passing that off because Charlie joined my lab in the last year and you're kind of a hybrid, but coming from the biology perspective and you've seen the kind of conversations that we have with collaborators and within the group. What's your feel on that, that question of explaining your modeling results to biologists? Yeah, it's... Um... I guess one of the toughest things about it is keeping in mind what, like, I guess, I guess there's, mm, let's see, there's kind of a tension on that you do, you always have to do some explaining, but you also need to consider what is, um, what is useful for you to convey that there is a, that like they are not, you that what is 
paramount in their mind is not what is paramount in your mind. And therefore, like in order for it to be a useful conversation, you need to carefully consider not just like, what do I think you need to know, but what are you looking for? And that might be the same thing. That might not be the same thing. You might have to convince them that they need to change what they're looking for, but you still need to have that, that analysis and think about like, okay, what, what actually needs to be conveyed here that is most useful? Like for me, like for my needs, I like, I need to say something or ask something because it's going to affect the model that I'm working on, but also like what is useful for the other half, for the, for the biologist side to, to understand. Um, yeah, I think we do a lot of talking about what is their mental map or the set of priors that they're bringing to this and how do we explain it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And yeah. once you get everything to click, then you can push on what you're trying to get out of it. And Belinda, what was your Bayesian with that comment? <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> I always okay. find that to really do really simple explanations really is useful because these guys are, have a lot of things in their minds. So if you can really simplify stuff, usually that's the best way you can do. And I always try to, when I do communications to these guys, I always try to do it as my 10 year old daughter, 10, 10 year niece could understand. And that's mm -hmm. actually use, usually results very well. And that goes both ways, right? So part of it is also, okay, you're telling me what you're doing with this plasmid. Could you please tell it to me like I'm 10 years old? Cause I have no idea what you're talking about. Exactly. And, and I think when we demonstrate that willingness to really understand where they're coming from, then we at that reciprocate it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a two-way education, right? That's, you know, um, yeah. And, and, and another comment that's been made, you know, like if you look at some of the, um, some of the references I was talking about is that sometimes you ask a biologist something and they give you, you know, you know, too much, right? You know, too many details and not, not the, not the, not the most important ones, right? They like to, you know, tell you the history of, you know, how this mutation was found in Drosophila and, you know, maybe that's useful, but not, not always, right? So, um, yeah, it's yeah, always putting it first in your mind, you know, like, you know, what does this other person need to know? What's their mindset? I think that that goes a long way. Um, good, yeah, those are great comments. Um, all right, so we just have a few minutes left, right? So our last thing is, um, I remember now actually. <laughs> oh yes, managing expectations for uh, for what, you know, what what is the outcome and the timeline for a modeling study, right? So, um, you know, I think, you know, I think I always tend to, you know, as a biologist to sort of underestimate how long it might take to, um, uh, to build a model and sometimes overestimate the amount of insight that you might get out of it, right? In, in terms of, will it explain everything? You know, what kind of, you know, what, what's the literal outcome that you're gonna have? And so I, I think a number of people have, um, um, you know, kind of tried to encapsulate, um, you know, what a, you know, what's the process of building a model, right? And here's one that I thought was pretty decent, you know, it sort of captures a number of the main things, but, you know, you've got your, you know, your real, up here is your, probably your biologist, right? Here's your experimental design. Um, you know, the model in your head is kind of going back, you know, sort of iterating with that. Uh, but if there is a, you know, computational model involved, then there's a fair amount of, uh, you've got to, uh, you know, build the model, uh, con conceptualize it, calibrate it, validate it, uh, optimize it. There's a lot of things going on under the hood that, you know, might take months. And so, um, uh, you know, so that's important. Um, I also, I wanted to put this up too as sort of a, uh, this is something, there's a, a computational scientist who works in my group, uh, whose name is Mike, right? You know, and I think he made this kind of out of, sort of out of frustration with me, because I, I think I would keep asking him, you know, what, you know, could we build a model of that, right? Yeah, could we, you know, what, and so um, he developed this flow chart for like, okay, what do you want, you know, what question do you want to, to answer uh, and at what level of detail and, you know, what do you really want to get out of it? 
Um, and so, you know, and, and if so, what kind of model would you build, right? You know, would you, uh, do you end up at doing say like an ODE model or uh, whether a phenomenological one that's sort of a, you know, broad scale or a more, you know, down to the nitty gritty, you know, every protein kind of model? Um, do you want to do more of a data data driven kind of model? So, um, you know, I think there's a number of ways to encapsulate this, right? But, um, you know, just to open up the discussion, you know, what what have you found is, you know, uh, you know your experience with, you know, biologists in terms of what they expect, uh, in terms of, you know, what you can, what a modeling study could provide, uh, what kind of timeline it would be on. Do, do they tip, you know, is it, are they all like me and they typically wildly underestimate how long it's going to take something or um, what do you, what do you think? Any thoughts? Well, uh, I guess I've only had one experience, so it's not a lot to go on. Uh, but one thing that surprised me as I started doing modeling was that the previous studies I had done had given me a lot of appreciation for uh, deductive structures where um, it's not possible to go from the sort of formal axiomatic foundation to uh, the functional space that, you know, you parameterize to get whatever system of equations defines your model, uh, that actually there are going to be uh, parts of the system that you that are not necessarily all uh, mm -hmm. following from one deductive train. And mm -hmm. that doesn't require any sort of fancy physics or anything like that. It's just a little bit of algebra um, and, and, uh, and, and actually th there's no conflict between that and being very pragmatic and, you know, trying to sort of emphasize, okay, well, what, what are the key table takeaways and what are we really after uh, when we do the work? Um, and so, so I, that, that was very jarring uh, because <laughs> I, I felt like people were kind of looking at me like I was either some kind of mistake or someone who didn't understand the value of time or, or something. And, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I agree. That's um, yeah. Yeah. You have to be able to manage yeah, you know, It's a two way conversation of what's, you know, um, you know, how, you know, like I think somebody had pointed, yeah, asked before, like I talked before about, you know, asking someone to do an experiment, like, is it going to take two years to do, um, or is it, um, you know, is it is it more feasible? I mean, what's the cost benefit to doing this experiment? Um, yeah, yeah, it's an education process for everybody. I think. I think that um, that um, setting the expectations up front is the key, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, early on, I think is yeah, yeah, yeah. always best. Yeah, I would say ninety percent of my collaborations end when I have make a preliminary model, and I say, well, now if we want more information, we might need to collect more data, or <laughs> if you want to know to answer that question you're interested in, we might need to redo this experiment. That's usually mm -hmm. the end of it. But if they go through with, after that, it's usually a pretty cool collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sort of like yeah. Now that you have to invest something, yeah, are you still going to stick around? But... How you know your true, who your true collaborator is. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. How do you deal with trying to get a new collaboration funded? Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, when I often feel like I've got to do a bunch of the model development research before we even write the proposal. Mm, mm. Because reviewers want to see like exactly how are you going to model this and how's it going to integrate with the data. And I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's real work. So I, I've gotten used to telling people expect it mm -hmm. to be a year <laughs> between us starting the talk and us being able to meaningfully put forward a proposal. But mm -hmm. um, have you found better ways of getting something started getting it funded without you essentially having to do a bunch of work for free up front. Yeah, that's, I mean, one, that's a fantastic point. I think, and I, I think it's actually something we see on the biology side too, right? I mean, you can't, it's very hard to get a proposal funded 
at least as I say, like the R01 level, where, or even like, the, even the ones that are supposed to be like exploratory, very often they expect, you know, quite a lot of preliminary work, right? You know, it's, and it's just, um, um, and so like, it's almost like every grant needs to be, a, there's like a, a two year unfunded phase before, you know, um, before, and I don't, and I, I think, I, I just in biology, I think we typically, the, the effectively what we do is just, you know, use the previous grant to fund the, <laughs> getting this data for the next grant, um, you know, and hopefully, and hopefully they sort of overlap enough that it makes sense. But, but yeah, and no, I think the thing you're describing is very true. And, you know, it's very hard to get a modeling, any grant with a, mo you know, with a modeling focus, if the, if it's not a very well-developed model already. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, is kind of kind of like a, um, a paradox or, you know, you know, you just, how do you, uh, how do you do that? I don't, I don't know. I don't have a good answer, basically. Carlos, what do you think? I'll tell you what has worked for me, um, um, Belinda. Uh, so I think I have gotten the first, so when we go, so I've done this now twice. So I don't know if that means that I've been successful or that I've been lucky. So I only have two data points. But uh, the first version of the grant, it's very, so the questions are interesting and important, right? But they the emphasis is more on the biology and the, the modeling is there to support the biology, right? And then the second iteration of the grant, so you know, after after three to five years of funding, then I can go more into the theory and the modeling, and then the biology supports the, the, the theoretical kind of predictions and theoretical findings. So that has worked well uh, with uh, with our collaboration with Vito, and that has worked well with our collaboration with um with um with Tina Iverson, and I'm hoping that will work really well with John. <laughs> you, John Albeck, not Cooper. But if you want to collaborate, John Cooper, that's fine with me too. Um, but, and so what I find is that reviewers want to see coherence and the biologists, uh, and so, so okay, the, the two challenges here, finding biologists that understand computation and computational people understand biology is challenging from a reviewer perspective. So I want to write the grant for the people that are going to review it. And in that sense, I want it to be their biology with pretty pictures of modeling or really cool modeling with pretty biological examples. And that's how I've approached them in a way that works for me. Um, so that's what I would say to that. Um, I don't know that, I don't know, I'll tell you in, in a year or two if, it, if, it, if it's consistent, but that has worked for me so far. I don't know, John, yeah. if you have any, any, any deep um, wisdom to share with us. Yeah, I, I guess I was I'd say in terms of grant success, I mean, yeah, I think what you're saying, you know, is, I mean, sometimes with grants, I've, I've just found, I mean, usually the success of the grant isn't necessarily, it, there's, there's a huge amount of sarcasticity to it, right? And sometimes, yeah. you know, sometimes reviewers will find, you know, they'll find all the, all the holes, right, you know, that you knew were there and, and just blow it apart. And sometimes they'll be like, you yeah, know, that's fine, you know. And um, yeah, I, I haven't found a consistent way to sort of necessarily, you know, there's things you can head off, right? But um, but yeah, I guess, yeah, I, I, over time, I guess, um, resubmitting it a lot. <laughs> I guess. Well, you can always do that. <laughs> I guess the challenge is, um, you know, for the biologists I'm working with, I've got stuff funded, but for, with the biologists I'm working with, they're usually building on a line of investigation that they've been working on for a very long time. So they have the preliminary data, you know, they're ready to roll. And then they come talk to me for the first time. And, you know, the last grant that was funded, I didn't know a damn thing about plants. And this is a plant biologist, <laughs> right? You can try. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm trying to learn all of these basics so I can even begin to say what is an appropriate modeling framework and put forward some reasonable sort of outcomes mm -hmm. that we can shape a narrative around. We got the grant funded after three submissions and the, the criticisms were not about the modeling. <laughs> they were yeah. about the experimental preliminary data. So there's two things I can, I can say. So where are your collaborators funded? What agencies fund them? Or, and where are you? Uh, we've been funded by NSF. NSF. And are you in a university or, or a national lab? Or I am now in a national lab with a joint appointment with the university. Okay, so so can you get NSF at, at a national lab? So that's why I was asking that. So NSF has really friendly funding mechanisms for initial collaborations. And I've used this once where I um, my collaborator was funded by NSF and they had a grant and I said, hey, you know, we're trying to collaborate. Could you give us 
uh, some money to get this going and they gave us you know funding for a postdoc you know and that worked pretty well to kind of get some funding going there's uh, there's two mechanisms eager and i forget what the other one is eager and aspire, aspire. aspire. raise i think they killed inspire oh. it's raise now if there's oh, it's raise. and then nih depending on your program officer they have access to supply to to uh to supplements so I've actually done, used this mechanism to to get funding for collaborators uh, off of my NSF of my NIH grant where I can say, hey, I need a supplement to do this study that we didn't think about that would actually make this better. And uh, so it, it depends, your relationship with your program officer can catalyze these interactions. Okay, good to know. I'm a recent transfer from the engineering directorate to funding in the bio directorate. So is that bio that you're talking about or another? Yeah, yeah okay. So that's interesting. Your Oak Ridge, so you're we really should make a, a meeting of the local people here. There's so many locals. Yeah. I love it. Oak Ridge is an awesome place. Congratulations. Thank you. I still haven't seen it physically working remotely, but you know, it's all good. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I know we're having a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Um, I would defer to the speakers. I'm not sure if you if you have the time to continue having the conversation or if you want to connect with folks over in Wonder. But I also want to respect that it's 506. And um, if people have things to do, I also don't want them to feel obligated. So what do you guys think? My kids are going to yeah. walk in a minute, so I have to go. <laughs> yeah, I'm in a similar, uh, similar predicament here. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate everybody who's joined us. Uh, you know, everybody who's, you know, maybe, uh, John, VJ, Belinda, uh, Renee, everybody's kind of has provided their thoughts and uh, opinions. Yeah, this was this was informative for me, and uh, I enjoyed enjoyed this a lot. So let me just thanks say thanks to you all. Um, and yeah, I think we should probably wrap it up now. And um, yeah, good luck. Enjoy the rest of the. Um, the the FYIM and um, I yeah, hope to yeah hope to see you soon. So. All right. thank awesome, you. thank you so much, and thank you for our uh, to our speakers for uh, leading such a wonderful discussion. So thank we'll you. see you all tomorrow, and those that can attend the lightning talk, uh, we look forward to interacting with you at that time as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Take care, everybody.